All right. So thank you, everyone. Uh, John Scalera from UCI. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about continuous compression staples. So these are my disclosures. Uh, I have no financial conflict or interest with really any of these devices. Um, I've used them a few times. Uh, I'm still very much undecided as to when I'm going to use them again. Uh, then, I, you know, hopefully I can share some of this, but I actually learned a decent amount uh, making this presentation. Hopefully I can pass some of this on to you. So the shape memory effect is something that uh, is, is kind of critical to understand uh, when you're thinking about night and all staples. And uh, it's the ability for a material to return to a deformed or, or temporary state uh, and assume its original permanent shape. And this can be done in a handful of different ways. And there are different triggers. Uh, it, there, it's used a lot in, in different fields of, of medicine and biotechnology. Uh, and they all have different triggers. And for these night and all staples, uh, temperature seems to be the, you know, the body temperature is, is the one that is the, the trigger. The technology itself is not new. And if you're wondering where night and all comes from, uh, it's, it's the alloy, the nickel titanium, which was developed at the Naval Ordnance Lab in the laboratory. When uh, these guys, Bueller and Wang, were asked to research or develop a new alloy for the U.S. Navy Polaris reentry vehicle. And what ended up happening is when they mixed nickel and titanium in essentially equal uh, parts, they found a, a, a metal alloy that behaved completely different than, than anything else that they've uh, been kind of toying around with. There's two phases. If you get kind of into the nitty gritty of this uh, technology, uh, the Martin Siddick and then the Austin Siddick or Austinitic, and I apologize if I completely butchered those, uh, but I literally just learned them in the last couple of days. Um, and it's the terms that describe the alloy below the transition temperature or the trigger, uh, which makes these, uh, which makes this metal very elastic. And then after the transition temperature, or like in, uh, in these staples, a lot more rigid. And so this is what gives uh, these compression staples a significant amount of rigidity after they've been uh, placed into the human body. Nickel titanium alloy in, in of itself is actually pretty attractive in terms of uh, its biocompatibility uh, with regard to you know, how we think about fractures, low elastic modulus, really high strength, uh, incredibly durable in terms of fatigue strength and being able to uh, undergo uh, or withstand you know, repetitive loading, high re resistance to corrosion. And when they've looked and done histologic studies on some of these staples that have been in for a long, long time, there's really uh, very little wear or very little concerning histologic findings uh, around the interface uh, of the nickel titanium to the, the osteocytes. So uh, really pretty attractive in terms of um, an alloy to be used for uh, orthopedic surgery. If you've never seen these things, uh, this is the general gist of how they're used. And so you have two pre-drilled uh, pilot holes that are used. And oftentimes these are placed bicortically um, across a small bone. And there's usually a little handle that actually spreads the two tines or the two ends of the staples out. The staples then placed into the bone. And then once the handle or um, mechanism that actually kind of opens these tines up is removed, then it deploys. And then there's continuous compression, uh, which is generated across the end of the, the staple. Like most other things in orthopedics, this is actually nowhere near new or novel. Uh, I went back into PubMed and kind of dug around a little bit. And uh, this is one of the first papers that had come out in 1983, and it seems like the folks in, in and around Shanghai were using this since the early 80s uh, and published some of their work in uh, the journal listed below, which I was unable to uh, obtain in any way, shape, or form, uh, but did find this article on injury in 1993, uh, which is actually just a bunch of night and all staples. And so uh, something that has gained a lot of attention recently uh, again, was published, uh, you know, almost 30 years ago. Uh, and again, if you look at some of the instrumentation below, very similar. And so what they did is they had a, a night and all staple, uh, and they used this and placed these across transverse fractures in order to gain compression. So almost in a way that you'd think about using a tension band construct uh, across fractures that had well opposed surfaces. And if you look here, they were using them in some of the very fractures that we think about using a tension band construct in, right? A transverse patella fracture, a relatively simple uh, proximal ulna fracture in the olecranon, transverse uh, or relatively straightforward uh, 
medial malleolus fractures as well as uh, distal fibular shaft fractures. And so again, uh, 1993, uh, published a long, long time ago. And again, a resurgence uh, almost 30 years later. There's been a decent amount of biomechanical evidence uh, and literature that's looked at this. Uh, and again, in different bones, but again, this, is, this comes out of the AO, AO Research Institute in Davos, um, looking at the, the strength of these staples in a uh, transverse patellar fracture model, um, showing the, the strength and the, um, the ability to resist deformation um, across the extensor mechanism. I think this one was a little bit interesting. This, uh, this came out of the Journal of Experimental Orthopedics in 2016, but you know, some of these staples are placed in a uniplanar uh, orientation, uh, oftentimes, especially in larger bones uh, or more complex um, uh, fractures, they may be used in, in a biplanar. And then uh, in this study, they compared them to a plate and screw construct, which was a non-locking system. And so I think the take home here is that, remember that each of these staples, even though it does provide compression across a transverse fracture model, it is just a single point. And so when they looked at lateral bending, uh, the plate was, was far superior to the, the staples, even when placed in a biplanar uh, position with regard to lateral bending. Again, because each one of these tines from the staple, or each one of these pegs from the staple is just a single point to pivot around. We have multiple options for interoperative compression of simple fractures. Uh, we can do dynamic compression through a dominant plate, uh, which is the, the implant of, of choice, say for a transverse or simple radius fracture. Oftentimes we're now using provisional or permanent mini fragment plates. And then one of my favorites is a modified clamp through drill holes for very simple fractures. And so um, I just pulled some of these images from a previous talk, but just demonstrates the use of unicortical plates placed through an open wound as patient had an open segmental tibia fracture. Mini fragment plates used as a provisional reduction tool uh, before nailing and then the plates were removed. And so uh, again, mini fragment plates used as a provisional reduction instrument. Like I said before, I think this is one of my, my favorites and these are commercially available from um, uh, a manufacturer, but oftentimes, uh, and in my hospital, I've just used a, a bending iron and bent the ends of uh, point to point uh, vapor clamps in order to produce a point to point clamp that can be used for transverse fractures. And so, and you can do this in, uh, in multiple different orientations. You can make one straight and one bent, uh, two straight, and you can modify them really in any way you want. And so, uh, in terms of intraoperative provisional compression, this is actually very effective. Now, the difference being here with the plates and or with these clamps, these don't stay in place, right? And so it does not have the ability to generate continuous compression across a fracture line like the staples do. I think cost is one of the big considerations. And so I dug a little bit into our uh, cost system here at, at the University of California, Irvine. And depending on the manufacturer, most of these staples are about 1.5 or about $1,500 to $2,000 a, a staple. Varies a little bit by size, uh, but at least at UCI, we do have an institutional discount for some of these manufacturers. And so uh, we're paying about half of what the list price is. In comparison, it depends again on the the, the plate and whether you're using locking screws or non-locking screws or using a three hole plate or a seven hole plate. Um, but the cost of that construct, if you think about that as a provisional reduction tool, which I think it, at this point is now pretty well accepted uh, as a technique is anywhere between one to $2,000 uh, per construct. So these mini fragment plates are not cheap either. So before you start you know, poo-pooing the staples, uh, the mini fragment plates that you're putting on uh, are not cheap either. I think the orthopedic applications are, are relatively well known in the foot and ankle world. Uh, for any of you all who do foot and ankle surgery, uh, these things have taken off like, like wildfire. And so for a lot of these osteotomies and small bones, especially uh, around the great toe, um, there is a, a lot of excitement about these staples in terms of uh, being able to generate continuous compression and get these osteotomies to heal. If you dig a little bit further, and, and I was able to kind of, you know, putz around a little bit on the internet over the last day or so, uh, there's all sorts of things now that have nitinol in them. And so uh, many of you are probably familiar with the, the proximal humerus and uh, distal radius and, and uh, proximal radial cage constructs that are out there. There's intramedullary hind foot nails now that have a preloaded nitinol wire to allow or create continuous compression across a, uh, an osteotomy or a fusion site. And then there's actually an a intramedullary nail that has nitinol essentially wings or pegs that will deploy uh, 
and create a, a essentially an interlocking interface. So instead of using any of the interlocking bolts that we've been talking about, uh, use these distal pegs, which is, which is kind of wild as well. I think if you're just looking for a good introduction to fracture fixation and Knight and L staples, uh, Pat Wider, who uh, in full disclosure is a, uh, is a paid consultant for J&J, uh, &J, who is one of the first companies uh, to kind of introduce this into fracture fixation. But I actually think this is a really well-written and um, unbiased, well, it's a relatively unbiased article with regard to the uses of, of Knight and L staples. And just highlighting the fact that you know, simple fracture patterns are best treated with continuous compression. If you think about the AO principles, you know, always be compressing, um, you know, compression of simple fracture patterns, you know, in, uh, in a lot of instances with whether it's malleolar fractures or uh, radius and ulna shaft fractures is, is really a, is a tenant that we continue to practice by. There's not a lot of literature clinically out on these, uh, on these uh, implants. Uh, and I think identifying the proper indications is, is really key. And one of the final things that they say and one of the final highlights in their takeaways is that this is not a technology that's a substitute for lag screws or traditional plating uh, or other plate and screw construct. It's simply just another tool that's available uh, for fixation. And so all of these cases are the ones that have come from uh, this paper. But again, here, a complex uh, scapular body with intraarticular involvement of the caudal segment of the glenoid. And you see on the bottom left there, the, uh, the staple that's used and then the nice reduction um, on the axillary lateral with the staple in the position closest to the glenoid surface. And so uh, a use here of a simple fracture line that's uh, compressed with a staple. Here you can see that this is a more complex uh, ulnar shaft fracture with a relatively simple radial shaft fracture. And for the radius, they actually use a mini fragment plate uh, as a orthogonal reduction uh, tool here. And then with the segmental ulna, multiple staples that are placed alongside and then adjacent to or orthogonal to a dominant uh, ulnar shaft plate. So again, just a couple cases here. Uh, the last one, acetabular fracture looks like a you know, posterior column uh, or transverse pattern here. And again, along that fracture line, which exits into the sciatic notch, multiple staples along there with the dominant um, reconstruction style plate along the, the posterior surface uh, of, the, of the acetabulum. So just a handful of cases. And again, these are all from that review paper, which were in uh, ACNA, but uh, something to take into consideration and look at. I think the contraindications for the te this technology, again, the staples rely on their interface with the cortical bone as well as uh, the bone within the, the cancellous surface. And so if patients are osteoporotic or they have cortical bone in which these deployed staples will cut through, then they're not going to do any good. They're simply a, a, a static um, implant once they've kind of uh, gone to their final position. So if in poor bone or comminuted fractures or osteoporosis, I would not use these. So I'm just going to show you a couple cases of mine and show you some of the indications. And this is a 20 year old female who had a closed femur tibia and foot injury. And the foot injury was not significant, but she had instability. You can see the dorsal comminution um, over the uh, lateral cuneiform and the cuboid and the inner cuneiform as well as the uh, base of the first are slightly off there in the, uh, in the CT scan. And you can see, and we were, if you were able to go through this, you'd see that she had instability. This is a pretty subtle injury, but unstable nonetheless. And so uh, address the dorsal comminution on the lateral aspect of the midfoot, and then use multiple staples uh, to control the, uh, the instability in the, on the medial side. And then here she is at five months. And you know, while you may think that these are uh, low profile, I can tell you that uh, while it's probably more low profile than a larger plate and screw construct, uh, this patient doesn't like her <laughs> the, she's a relatively thin patient and she does not like this over her midfoot. She can feel this as she ties her shoes. And so I'm going to be probably taking these out relatively soon. So they're not as low, prof, ro, low profile as you'd think. This is a patient who's a 62 year old male. Uh, I just had this kind of disaster lower extremity, which was fixed at an outside hospital and came in draining pus. And I took everything out and put a big cement spacer. I really tried to convince him of an amputation uh, because he just has a essentially has the worst protoplasm that I could that I could imagine, but he wouldn't let me take his foot off. Um, and so I got rid of his infection, 
and uh, decided to go for a, a fusion. And so kind of flat cut them on the tibia. I took the cartilage off of the talus, uh, got good bleeding surfaces, kind of potted the uh, tailored dome into the uh, distal tibia, and then used two staples. And I should have taken a fluoro shot of it, but I used two staples to kind of maintain that compression while I put the, the hind foot nail in and then use the external device on the hind foot nail in order to, uh, uh, to compress and then lock in the, uh, the interlocks and the talus and then the calcaneus. And so um, this is the final construct. Actually, no, I'm sorry, this is the final construct. This is him at four months, which is the last time that I saw him. So um, I don't know where he is uh, at this point, but maybe walking around, maybe coming to a clinic near you uh, soon. And then this is, uh, the last case, and I will tell you that after uh, identifying that I, I may be giving this case, I, I tried to do something a little bit uh, different. And this is a 53-year-old female. Um, this is a recent case. who's was carjacked. And then she was actually run over by her own car. Uh, and you can see she has like a symphyseal disruption as well as four rami fractures. She's a very thin um, Asian female. And so you know, while I truly prefer intramedullary fixation for rami fractures like this, I was not able to identify a corridor, uh, a corridor in which a straight screw could uh, adequately transverse or adequately traverse these these rami fractures before he, fixing the synthesis. And so, um, fixed her or kind of wired her uh, rami together and got everything lined up uh, correctly. Fixed the posterior ring with a uh, transiliac transsacral screw, and then got her synthesis together, um, and was pretty happy with my reduction on on those two. And then before definitively fixing the, uh, the rami, I did this, uh, which, you know, I guess it, for, at least for me uh, is pushing the envelope. This is very atypical for something that I would normally do, but I liked it because it allowed me to then go back and, and utilize any kind of slop I had in the anterior ring uh, to definitively fix her. And again, uh, you know, plating of the rami is, is not my, not my go-to, but for this patient, uh, worked really well and was able to provide her with, uh, anterior stability. And you see that I actually, I did use staples in a biplanar, uh, position, um, because even with that one staple in, uh, the patient's synthesis with a complete disruption had a decent amount of, of, uh, of movement. And so after I placed the, the biplanar staple from A to P, uh, it definitely locked it up. Uh, much better and was pretty happy with, with the final uh, result. So in conclusions, uh, use of memory shape implants, uh, nitinol is not new. This has been around since the 80s, the technology developed in the late 50s. The concept really here is providing and developing or developing and providing continuous compression across a simple fracture line. Uh, it's very prevalent in small bone surgery. If you look in the literature, all sorts of case reports of uh, scaphoid non-unions, uh, foot fractures, foot osteotomies, things like that, which are treated with these. Um, I think cost is a factor. You have to take that into consideration, especially this day and age. Uh, but understand that if you're using mini fragment plates and screws very commonly, then it's you may be kind of running into an equivalence uh, position. Comminution and poor bone quality is definitely contraindication. And then in orthopedic trauma, I think provisional or adjunctive fixation is really the the role for it. So kind of yet to be defined, uh, but definitely picking up a little bit of steam uh, for sure. Thank you very much.